The stark geometry of the Lovell telescope stands out as an icon on the gentle rolling countryside at the Jodrell Bank Observatory just south of Manchester. Today the radio dish is used as part of international science projects, but the origin of Jodrell Bank dates back to the aftermath of the Second World War and one man's ambition. So the observatory here at Jodrell Bank began in 1945 and it was when um, Bernard Lovell um, arrived here straight after the Second World War. Um, he'd actually worked in the physics department at Manchester University before the war, gone away to work on wartime radar. So he actually uh, led a team that developed airborne radar for nighttime flying. At the end of the war, went back into the university and wanted to use some of the technology, the equipment that developed in the war to do physics. The university had some botany grounds out here at Jodrell Bank, about 20 miles south of Manchester. He brought all his kit out at the end of 1945, set it up. He was given permission actually to stay for two weeks and he never left. By transforming the wartime radio equipment into scientific tools, Lovell and his colleagues have begun to realise the huge potential of studying the radio sky. This soon led to the idea of building a giant steerable dish that would be the world's largest radio telescope. They detected shooting stars, meteors, so they, were, they worked on a project trying to understand where they came from. But then they built another giant telescope. It was about um, 218 feet in diameter, um, just pointed straight upwards, it didn't move around. And with that, they discovered the first radio waves from another galaxy, from the Andromeda galaxy. So they thought, oh, this is great. You know, we've got this new technology. Big dishes are, are great for radio astronomy. They collect a lot of radio waves. But the problem with this one is it doesn't move. It doesn't steer. What we need is one at least that big that we can move around and point at any part of the sky. So that was when they started building this one in, in, in 1952. The dish for Lovell's new telescope was a huge 250 feet in diameter and the construction project was on a scale unprecedented in radio astronomy. By the mid to late 1950s, the telescope was significantly over budget and politicians were quickly losing patience with Lovell and his extravagant toy. But when you get to the sort of 1956, 1957 era, actually the telescope was massively in debt. Um, nobody had ever built anything like this before in the world. Um, so really they didn't understand how much it would cost and they'd overrun the budget um, massively. And so actually, you know, Lovell in fact was in danger of, of being thrown into prison as, as, a, as a result of this. Um, the, the workers that were building the telescope were on strike because there was no money to pay them. I said to Henry Brown, we need a miracle to save us. Well, that kind of miracle came on October the 4th, a few weeks later, 1957, uh, when the, the Sputnik 1 was launched. Lovell was contacted by the British government and asked whether his new telescope would be able to track the launch rocket used by the Soviet Union to send Sputnik into orbit. The answer was that yes, it could. The fear at the time was that the next Soviet missile flying overhead could be a nuclear warhead. Suddenly, the price tag of Lovell's telescope appeared to be justified. Of course, the first uh, uh, achievement was, if you like, a technological achievement in uh, uh, using it as a radar, detecting the launch rocket of Sputnik 1, which was uh, a, a very fortunate thing because it, it suddenly made people realize how valuable the telescope was. And so it came about that we in, at Jodrell, I say we, it was really Bernard Lovell, um, uh, became the most likely place to have a radar which would pick up the launch of an intercontinental ballistic missile uh, launched in, in Russia, in, in the Soviet Union. And we were uh, standing by for this. It was never really, never used operationally, but um, we were ready to do that if necessary. By the early 1960s, the responsibility for spotting warheads was transferred to a Royal Air Force station in Yorkshire called Filingdales. Jodrell Bank was finally able to focus on the science, and the 1960s was an exciting time for radio astronomy because the Cambridge University astronomers Jocelyn Bell Burnell and Anthony Hewish had just discovered pulsars. These rapidly rotating neutron stars emit beams of radio radiation in a manner reminiscent of a lighthouse. The first days of the pulsars were the most exciting time for me. As you know, they were discovered uh, by the radio astronomers in Cambridge, and my colleague there, Anthony Huish, sent us the positions and the periodicities of the first few 
and we realized that this big steerable dish was the absolutely ideal instrument for following these things for a considerable time and um, measuring periodicities, signal processing and so forth. Today, Pulsar research is still a key focus of the work at Jodrell Bank. But the technologies have moved on significantly and Jodrell's telescopes are now part of a network called eMerlin. These telescopes work in synchrony to track objects across the sky. Well, e Merlin's a network of seven radio telescopes spread out 217 kilometres across the UK. Right now, the Lovell Telescope here at Jodrell Bank and the Mark II Telescope and the five other telescopes across the UK are all pointing at the same object. Right now, it's looking at a calibrator source and then it's going, going to go into a programme of looking at some distant, dusty galaxies which are in the process of forming their stars. And that's one of the key science topics for eMerlin, actually, to work out how galaxies form their stars uh, in the early universe, uh, the role of black holes at the centres of those galaxies, and that interaction between the black holes at the centres and the process of star formation in galaxies. Since its beginnings, Jodrell Bank has also captured the public interest. In recent times, a new outreach centre has opened, and thousands of people now come to visit every year. When the Lovell Telescope was, was built back in the 1950s, it sort of immediately attracted attention, a massive structure like that rising up out of the countryside. So people basically started to flock here to find out about what happened, what we did with that telescope. Um, so there's been a visitor centre here actually since the 1960s, but the new, the new buildings here were opened in 2011. Um, and we now attract about 150,000 visitors every year. 15,000 of those are school children on educational visits. Jodrell Bank has also branched out into hosting live music concerts and science festivals. Here at Jodrell's we get bands to come along and play. So the first year we had the Flaming Lips, um, we've had Elbow, um, we've had Sigurost, um, all come here, attract a lot of people in for the music, but then alongside that um, we celebrate the science with a science festival with scientists from here, from elsewhere across the university and indeed from other uh, universities and organisations across the country. From tracking Soviet space activities to hosting popular music festivals, Dodgeville Bank has always been far more than just a research facility. In the future, who knows what else it may have branched out into. At Dodgeville, the sky has always been the limit.